listening to Teenage Voice, an addiction recovery podcast bringing you stories of recovery from every experience. I'm your host, Lindsay Whitaker. Addiction is a family disease. So when your child, spouse, parent, or friend is struggling with addiction, everyone is affected. But what can you do to help your loved one get better? How do you talk to them without pushing them further away? I created a guide that takes all the mystery out of what to say or do during your loved one's recovery. I'm very pleased to announce that our resource hub on tdhvoice.com is in the works, and I just wrote this family support guide that will be available there for free. For now, you can find it at tdhvoice.com slash family dash support dash guide. Today's guest you may be familiar with. She's a sober blogger, influencer, and recovery advocate. If you're a fan, you might know her from The Sobriety Collective, a blog that highlights creatives in recovery. Laura Silverman got sober when she was just 24, and she's been sober for 11 years. She joined us remotely last week to share about her experience being a young sober person, what it's like maintaining a social life as well as a healthy recovery, and how she deals with imposter syndrome. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Laura. Thank you for having me. We're really, really excited. Um, actually, me and Laura just went to She Recovers and we met for in real life for the very first time. Um, so that was really exciting. It was super awesome. Um, yeah, it was definitely a really amazing experience. There were there were a couple of sort of like big moments for me. Um, first of all, if you can just kind of imagine. There were like 500, 550 women there. So it was a lot of feminine energy and there was just like a lot of emotions in any room at any given time. I had a pretty break open um, moment um, and it was it was really kind of scary to just be completely vulnerable and honest in front of 500 women. But Something that I've been feeling, and it's possible that other women feel this too, and I'm, I've am i been feeling a touch of imposter syndrome, um, and some people are surprised to hear that since I have this blog and website, The Sobriety Collective, which has been going um, since April of 2015, and you know, I'm super proud of what I've built and the community that I've created, and, and um, I often feel like I don't belong on the stage um, of, like, the recovery space. And I think it all sort of boils down to a lot of like past trauma of when I was bullied as a kid and, and as a teenager as well. And, um, and so I shared that in front of everyone and cried uh, so hard. (laughs) And what, what ended up happening was that it was just a super powerful experience of all these women coming together and supporting me, even though I felt like they might be laughing at me, which they weren't. It all kind of happened during Tara Moore's um, talk, and she is this phenomenal woman. I encourage you all to go out and buy her book if you haven't yet. I'm reading it right now. It's called Playing Big, and it's all about um, you know identifying your inner critic and befriending your inner mentor and just learning to be empowered because there's there's a line in the book, something that she had talked about with one of her mentors in the past was that, American women are liberated, Mm -hmm. but they're not empowered. That was just like a, whoa, light bulb moment. Yeah, I got Um, chills. I got chills when she said that. So many chills because it's like, hashtag all the chills. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because, you know, we have so many freedoms now. And yet, we're still often struggling to feel empowered. And one of the takeaways um, from that experience that she recovers in LA is that um, oftentimes, when you're going through a pretty major shift in your life, a pretty big breakthrough, it doesn't feel like sunshine and unicorns and puppies and roses and ice cream and all the good things. It feels like awful and just um, terrifying. It can feel that way anyway. When you're going through something um, that leads to change and that leads to, you know, a better way of being for you, it often doesn't feel like that as you're going through it. And that was, that was really one of the key takeaways. And it also gives me some hope because there were some things I was going through that didn't feel so great. 
And uh, maybe that means that there's something on the horizon. Hey there, this is Lindsay, your host here on TDH Voice with something that you're all going to love. An ad. I promise to keep it short and sweet, so here it is. I'm starting the official TDH Voice monthly newsletter, obviously a working title, and it's going to be packed with insider-only extras from our guests, resources to help you in your recovery, and all kinds of cool free stuff. It launches in November, but sign up early and you'll get a surprise from me. Head to tdhvoice.com slash subscribe and sign up now. So I know that when you were here, we got to talking a bit about your story. And I know that a lot of your crowd, um, that they they are familiar with your story. But I kind of wanted to just touch on it just a little bit. So when did you first, like, when did you take your very first drink? Oh, goodness. I can actually remember the first time I took a sip of alcohol was in eighth grade. My friend had um, Coke in a water bottle. I didn't realize why. It's because she had mixed it with rum or vodka or something. And um, I took a sip and I was like, spit it out immediately. I was like, this is disgusting. (laughs) Uh, I wasn't ready then, (laughs) thankfully. But um, I think the first time it really clicked for me, I was 17. And it was the summer before my senior year in high school. And this is, of course, coming from you know, elementary school, middle school, especially. And middle school for me um, was in Nicaragua. And my dad was a diplomat. And um, middle school at that American, uh, American Nicaraguan school was actually fifth through eighth grade. So it was a long drawn out uh, junior high process. And it was very rough for me. I was bullied constantly. And so high school wasn't always easy for me either. And so just kind of coming into that summer, I had a lot of stuff that I didn't really um, recognize or look at. Um, I had a lot of anxiety and some panic attacks that had started to happen. Um, again, I wasn't really sure what any of it was, but that was kind of like sort of setting the stage for when I took my first drink that clicked for me. I was working as an intern that summer. I was hanging out with all of the kids that were popular from my school and from, you know, the American embassy, um, intern crowd. And I had a beer and I felt like such a rebel. God, I sound like a cliche when I say this, but um, I can tell you, and and some of you may know and some of you might not know, but I have always had, as far back as I can remember, um, obsessive compulsive disorder. I have OCD and I have just generalized anxiety. And um, when when I had that beer, really it was like a beer and a half, I felt so much more free in my brain. I felt less constricted by all of the stuff that I had going on in my head. And I felt that sort of like loopy, tipsy, like I've arrived feeling. It just, it felt right. And um, I had a really, really low tolerance then. And so um, two beers got me pretty drunk. And I remember feeling that it was just it was just amazing. For whatever reason, though, I didn't drink again until my high school graduation. And then, you know, I really picked up in college and beyond. But it was a pretty short drinking trajectory. Um, all said and done, I drank for six years from 18, you know, that first summer, 17, but 18 to 22, uh, 24 So that's typically the time where people are like either at the height of or that's when they start. Yeah, (laughs) I know. It's crazy. And I've met some people um, that say they didn't actually start drinking until they were like 25 or 26. Um, And these people aren't in recovery. The ones that I'm talking about, they're just like regular people who don't drink a ton, but didn't get into drinking for one reason or not until like their mid to late 20s. Whereas I was very much done by the time I was um, just 24. So, you know, It has not always been easy, especially as a young, young person in recovery and and in sobriety. Um, I certainly felt like I was the only person going through this. And I didn't, I didn't see any others like me quite some time. Um, You know, part of my story is having gone through the 12 steps and being part of a 12 step community at length for about two years. But when I was 24, and 25 and 26, like I kind of did things 
on my own for the most part and hadn't really met other people like me. And I had friends who were, my true friends were supportive of me and cut back on their own drinking. Definitely didn't drink around me and my family as well, of course, but I had a lot of drinking buddies that I realized were just that. And so, you know, our friendships either fizzled out or I had to put like a hard stop and boundaries on, I can't hang out with you again because I'm not drinking and you're a bad influence on me. And it's not my, it's not their fault that I got drunk, but it certainly didn't help the situation when I was hanging out with them. So social life as a young person in recovery is not easy. It's definitely doable. And there are a lot more tools now than there were in 2007 and 2008, but it was, it was definitely a challenge to start out with. Mm -hmm, For sure. I wanted to talk, take a minute to talk about uh, mental health because I know that's kind of your domain, and especially right now with it being National OCD Awareness Week. And you were telling me about a really cool interview that you've just done with Club Mental on Instagram. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Amy Keller Laird, she is the former editor of Women's Health Magazine. I actually met her at um, Mental Health America conference a couple of years ago. She was on a panel and she was amazing. And I was like, wow, here's this editor of Women's Health, which is a magazine that I read. And she was talking about her experience with OCD. And um, it was just so inspirational to see someone who I thought was cool and empowering and sharp to be so public about something that I've always had a lot of shame about. I can't remember how we got to talking, but um, we had followed each other on Twitter. And a few months ago, she said, I'm starting this new um, mental health community on Instagram um, called Club Mental, you know, make sure to follow me. She's been just producing amazing content. And so in my talking about OCD, just over the years, she asked me if I would be a part of this interview series for National OCD Awareness Week, where she interviews people who are um, outspoken advocates of mental health. And so I talked about my lived experience with OCD and how it impacts my recovery and if my sobriety and my OCD are related or how they all come together. So it's, it's a really interesting series that she has going on. I highly encourage everyone to check it out. They can find it either on Club Mental's Instagram or on mine at We Are Sober because I reposted it. But it's about 10 slides and you can read about how OCD manifests in my life, um, how it's related to my sobriety, um, when did I first notice that I had it, what are my struggles with it, have I had any sort of triumphs and successes with things that work for me. Moral of the story is that it's something that I still struggle with, and it sometimes goes into hiding, um, and then sometimes comes back, and it's always there. And I just have to be very vigilant about my mental health and well-being. Another thing that, that I would mention um, is that I get really, really annoyed when I see brands and people that just poke fun at OCD. Um, I'm so OCD about this or that or whatever. What they mean is that they're a little particular and anal about certain things. And that's okay to be. Um, but I would highly encourage them to not use language like that because there are some of us who actually I think 2% of the population, um, which translates to about one in 50 people have obsessive compulsive disorder and it's real and it's oftentimes debilitating. And a lot of people don't realize what it actually is and what it means to be afflicted by it. There are people who can fully recover and I'm working on being one of those people, but I'm 35 years old and I've had it since I was you know, six. It's just a thing that's part of part of my life right now. But it's a really cool series. And I would definitely encourage people to check that out. I'm sure Lindsay will put in the show notes, um, Club Mental's exact handle, because I think there's like an underscore somewhere. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll include all of these awesome resources in the show notes for sure. And thank you for sharing that with us. That's awesome. So you've been sober for 11 years, 10, 11 years? 11. Yeah. 11. Congratulations. Thank you. I can't believe it myself sometimes. Um, I've been sober definitely longer than I was drinking. So can you tell us, Laura, how do you do it? (laughs) Well, there are a lot of things that I learned from my time in Alcoholics Anonymous that even while the ideology and the people and their own ideologies 
didn't always work for me. There are a lot of sort of program tenets that stuck with me. And one of the things is, is one day at a time. Now, I don't say every morning when I wake up, today I won't drink. Let's just see how things go tomorrow or whatever. It's more like you can only live one day at a time. So, you know, just be present in your day-to-day life and, you know, make the commitment, even if you don't do it in words, because I'm past the point of like making a daily commitment to stay sober. It's just part of my, it's my default now. But this whole thing about one day at a time, it really applies to my mental health and my just state of being. And there is something to be said about that ism. So yeah, taking, taking things one day at a time, um, finding something that works for you. And I had to do a lot of trial and error, Also, as you get to the point of being in long-term recovery, you'll find that there are different things that work for you in different phases of your recovery. And in the beginning, I was just getting my feet wet with what it meant to not be drinking and not be a shit show and train wreck in my own life. And once I got some solid standing and footing with my sobriety, then it was like, okay, what kind of social supports can I seek out? And I did go to AA, like I said, for a while. You know, I found a therapist. I found a psychiatrist. What books can I read? I was a very, very avid reader in the beginning of my sobriety, reading everything that I could get my hands on. And I still love reading, but I am I am a slow reader. And a lot of it has to do with having OCD and not being able to stay on track with a book and it gets challenging. But um, so finding, finding lots of books um, and then just tapping into whatever resources work for you at any given time. So I think having an open mind and flexibility about what is working for you at any given point in time and not beating yourself up if something did work for you before isn't now, um, just being a seeker and um, finding what fits. So I would say that that's really important. One thing that I can struggle with and also believe is one of the most important things in a healthy recovery is having self-compassion and forgiveness. And I'm actually working on some things with an amazing, amazing Um, coach um, and spiritual teacher, Beverly Sartain. Um, She was, she was at, she recovers in LA. She's just this phenomenal woman. And, um, you know, I'm at the point where I recognized I want a coach. I also want a new therapist and I want to be able to work on, you know, things in my life. So um, being open to what you need um, is really crucial in recovery. And then of course, how do I do it? Well, I don't drink. Um, I stay away from situations that could be dangerous, obviously. Um, And then more subtly, like if, because I mean, a dangerous thing for me would be to go to like a rager, an all night party or something, but a more subtle thing that you can absolutely say no to if you don't want to go is, you know, a happy hour for a colleague or a friend's goodbye or something. You know, you may want to see that person, but if you are still early on in your recovery and you don't feel comfortable being around alcohol, then it's okay to say no. So learning to say no, learning to set boundaries for yourself, finding a community. And that also means your family, be it family of origin, family of choice, a combination of the two. Um, So finding people that you can have at your side who support you. And whenever you go to a social situation where you may encounter strangers or um, people you don't know very well, um, having someone there who knows you and, you know, you know, you can tell them you're not drinking and they can just, it's not about um, babysitting or them being accountable for your actions, but it's so that you have someone that you can sort of share the burden with. And as you get further along into your recovery, you can make those decisions as you see fit. I don't always tell people if I'm going to like a networking thing that I'm sober and I'm not drinking and, you know, but But if someone offers me a drink, I'll say, like, I don't drink. Or I'll make a joke and say, I don't drink anymore. Um, Or maybe I'll say, like, you know, I'm allergic to alcohol. Like, I break out in handcuffs. I think I was a little lucky that my my foray into sobriety stuck when it did. You know, I feel very fortunate that in my story, I haven't had relapses or lapses um, or recurrences of use, however you want to call it, which has been very important to me in terms of my sobriety and, and recovery. But I do think that if someone does have a lapse, they don't negate any progress that they've made before just by quote unquote falling into their old habits. Um, there are just so many things that go into it. It's hard to it's hard to replicate that for you know you can't replicate what worked for me for everyone else, but 
the key is to find something that um, that does work for you and to be open-minded and always seeking new knowledge and, and just being gentle with yourself too and not isolating. There's a lot. There's so much. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Well, I really, really appreciate you sharing your inspiration and your knowledge with us. I know everybody's recovery journey is is their own, but your your story and, and what you've done and I mean you've got eleven years, so you're doing something right, you know? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So I, I just hope that everyone listening today uh, feels as inspired as I do by your story. And I'm, I'm really grateful that you were here today to share it with us. Thank you for having me, Lindsay. I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. So um, I think a lot of people, when they're considering or thinking about maybe going sober, that they have that thought, oh, but my life will be so boring. Like, how am I going to have fun? Did you ever have that thought? And how did you sort of get over that? Like, how do you have fun? How do, you, how do you have fun without booze? Oh my gosh, I have that thought all the time, all the time. To put it plainly, before I was drinking, I was someone who judged people for drinking. When I was drinking, I judged people for not drinking. And now that I'm not drinking, I'm not judging people for drinking, but I highly encourage them to look at why they're doing it and make sure that they're not abusing it or themselves. Yeah, I had a lot of uh, trouble in the beginning, finding things that were fun or finding that life could be fun without boozing it up. Um, Since it had been my sort of default for the past six years and I had become that popular party girl. I know Kelly um, of the Sober Senorita talks a lot about how she used to be a party girl and that was sort of her identity. And in college, um, that was my identity too. And so shedding that, um, I was, I was honestly fearful that I would become, you know, that dorky, nerdy, bullied girl again. So in the beginning, my focus wasn't so much on how do I have fun, but how do I stay healthy and how can I support my burgeoning recovery journey? So a lot of the things that I did was cancel on social situations and social outings. I didn't go to a bar, I think for the first like five or six months. I read, I watched movies, I hung out with my family a lot and and some close friends. Then as I started to get a little more comfortable in being sober, um, I could find activities and groups of people that, um, that didn't necessarily center around alcohol. I think something that can be really helpful for people, and it, it helped me sort of in my mid to later Um, recovery is meetup.com. You can find so many different types of groups out there and some of them are are revolving around drinking, but there are just as many more that are um, centered around um, healthy living, like hiking. And um, if you're into crafting, there's like embroidery circles. And if you're into reading, there's book clubs that aren't booze driven. I've been in a booze driven book club and Um, We didn't really talk about the book a whole lot. I joined a karaoke group a few years ago, and I may have been one of the only sober people there, but it was something that I enjoyed doing, and I could do it without drinking and without worrying about people pressuring me to drink. And the more and more sobriety is sort of becoming like this thing to be, um, well, not just this thing to be celebrated, but like drink revolution, um, this sort of offshoot of um, IOGT International, um, and I forget what it stands for, but it's the Swedish based NGO that does just amazing work on education and policy around alcohol. And this, this thing that they started, Drink Revolution, really encourages people to try on sobriety and see what that's like and, and seek out activities that, that don't revolve around drinking. Um, there are definitely ways to socialize, um, without drinking and ways to have fun without drinking. You just got to be a little creative sometimes. And if you don't see a community out there, start one because I guarantee you that someone else is looking for you and someone else is looking to connect. All right. Thank you again, Laura Silverman for being here with us today. Thank you, Lindsay Whitaker. (laughs) (laughs) If you want to reach out to Laura, her website is thesobrietycollective.com. You can also follow her on Instagram at We Are Sober. All of the resources mentioned on today's episode can be found on tdhvoice.com slash episode slash Laura Silverman. 
Or you can also find all of the resources that we talked about today on Facebook by searching at TDH Voice. If you or someone you love is struggling with addiction, please call our recovery helpline at 877-203-8186 to speak to an addiction specialist. Thanks to everyone who supports TDH Voice directly. We wouldn't be here without you. If you're new to the show, head over to tdhvoice.com support to learn about how you can help us. Until next time, I'm your host, Lindsay Whitaker, and this has been another episode of TDH Voice.